Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and really I'm just here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That certainly means helping you improve your photographic skills and enabling you to become a stronger business owner, but it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We are sponsored by PhotographersEdit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. There's a part of me actually that wishes that we did this live so I could give context to the week and the day and the things that are going on and the weather. It happens to be a Friday, uh, about noon Eastern on Friday, and I have a brand new guest with me, Coley James. Coley, thank you for hanging out with me. We've been having some fun conversation already. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Nathan. And, and actually, we're getting into, it, it's kind of crazy. I've recorded over 460 episodes now for this podcast, and somehow we're going to be touching on a topic today that we've only, I think, done one dedicated episode on before, CRMs, and we're going to put a different spin on it, if you will. So I'll just, I'll leave that little teaser for everybody listening in. We'll get to more details here in just a little bit. Um, Coley, I, I'm trying to think of actually the first time that you and I had the chance to meet in person. This isn't the first time we've had conversation. What would that, what would that have been? Oh, definitely not. So the first time that you and I actually met was way back in, I think it was 2017 or 2018. It okay. was a photo native. It was a very brief interaction. I mean, you probably wouldn't remember it, but when we actually got to know each other and became friends was at the photo cookout in 2019. Yes. Yeah, then that one was in New Orleans. Uh, we just and it had, was awesome. Oh, it was incredible. Uh, I, I mean, just amazing all around. And and then, of course, we just recently had one I've mentioned on the podcast here in the Chattanooga area um, within the last couple of months or so. Uh, not quite the same energy as it was in New Orleans, um, you know, thanks to COVID and and all its fallout. But nonetheless, um, it's it's an amazing uh, community. And for anybody who is not familiar with it, we'll make sure to link to the cookout conference in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. The next one's going to be in Orlando, centered around Disney down there, which is pretty exciting. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we'll make sure to link to that. I, I'm glad that we get a chance, Coley, to have conversation today. And it certainly feels like with a friend. And um, maybe just to give our listeners a little bit of context to who you are, I'm actually on the about page of your website. For anybody listening in, if you want to check out Coley's website, it's C-O-L-I-E-J-A-M-E-S, so Coley James Photography.com. And I'm in the about section. Um, I, I, as I scroll down through that about section, there are these wonderful pictures of your family, uh, your husband, James, and your daughter, Chloe, that are kind of further down the page. Tell me just a little bit about them. Uh, so we are about to, with my husband, James, we met in undergrad at a uh, university in Texas, and we're actually about to hit our 20th wedding anniversary in March. Wow. Please don't think, please don't think that that dates me. We got married young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm. And um, Chloe is our, our, our hard kid. We tried for years of infertility to have her and we were finally blessed back in 2009 to uh, get pregnant with her. And she's 10 years old and she's definitely the light of our life. And it's funny that you're mentioning all those pictures because one of the things that I try to emphasize to everyone mm -hmm. is that even if you are a photographer, you need to hire someone else to do your family photos. It's so important that you are present in the photos and that you are not just taking them all yeah. the time. That there's this black and white photo of what looks like Chloe hugging James and you're in the background and it just feels very real and raw and, and there's so much <laughs> warmth and, and I just, I love the image. It's beautiful. Oh, Nathan. So you know what? We didn't, we didn't uh, practice this at all, but I'm going to tell you about that picture because it's funny. Um, that was one of the times that I hired a documentary family photographer, uh, Karen Jaycott to come into my house Okay, and James actually fell asleep and took a nap in Chloe's room. Okay. And so that picture of when they're hugging is when I came in and I was basically scolding him for taking a nap in the middle of our photo <laughs> session. He there's, does things like that quite often. <laughs> there's always a, another side of the story, isn't there? That's funny. Well, um, for anybody listening in, make sure you at least go take a look at these pictures, get to know Coley uh, on a different level through images um, there on her website. We'll link to that. And by the way, I'll just go ahead and throw in here as well. Coley's Instagram is Coley James. And we'll put that in the show notes as well, C-O-L-I-E-J-A-M-E-S. 
and uh, we'll link to that. You can see examples of her work uh, there and a little bit about her life as well and get to know her a little bit better that way. But let me go ahead and jump into the first question. And, and this is the one that we normally start off with, Coley, brand position. And um, I, I'm, I'm actually quite encouraged to see on the homepage of your website that you have a stated brand position there, plain and simple, clear as day, above the fold. But will you go ahead and share that with our listeners? Um, So I offer photos and films to family members in an experience that no one whines about and everyone gets to be part of the session. So again, that goes back to, I don't have um, a full roster of photographers as my clients. I shoot everyday people all the time, but I do have several photographers that come to me specifically because, you know, they're tired of not being in the photos and films. So I try to make everybody understand that the photo session itself is an experience that they won't forget. And that when they get the photos back, everyone will be present. Everyone will love them. I I really love the, and I don't think I've heard it quite phrased that that way before, an experience that no one whines about. I would love to see that like on the homepage, just splashed (laughs) across the homepage of your site, along with that that position statement. It used to be. And you know what? Now that you've said that, I'm going to have to go put it back on. I recently switched over to show it. So some of the things that were present on my old website got left off in the rehab. So maybe that needs to go back because it used to be front and center above the fold. (laughs) Oh, you got to do it. Well, and, and the reason I want to encourage you to do that, you, you again, unlike many photographers, you actually have a position statement there in bold, all caps, lettering, documentary, family, photographer, and then subtext is based in Boulder, Colorado, available anywhere planes fly. But, you know, there it, it's one thing to state the genre of photography that you offer. It's another thing to then put a spin on it, a twist on it. Um, and then, of course, follow up that statement with the service and the service actually mm-hmm. reflects that notion of an experience that no one whines about. I mean, it's, it's such a kind of a cute uh, way to say it, but then if you back that up with the experience then clients become, they, they get to know you as this experience and they're going to want to talk about it to others. And then the marketing matches the experience and it's just a win-win. I think it'd be really, really great. Yes. I, I actually have quite a few testimonials. The other part that I tell people is, you know, we have a phone conversation as part of my onboarding process. And I make sure that they know that if they hire me, they can't get rid of me. Like we become friends, we become family. I see you every year. So, you know, it becomes a thing of, we have to make sure that we like each other because I do become part of your family. And every time you want something documented, I assume that you're going to call me. (laughs) Well, shout out to uh, show it as well. You mentioned show it. I'm actually getting ready to build my own show it website, photography (gasps) website. Awesome. Um, I'm getting ready to to start a photography brand back up, and I've I've been kind of alluding to this idea on the podcast in various episodes. I'll probably do at least one, if not multiple, episodes around that topic later on. So details to come. But I'm going to use Show It, and of course, I'm a huge fan of Show It as a brand, and I'd certainly Todd Watson, their CEO, he's been on the show a number of times. Uh, so shout out to Show It as well, and uh, Haley will go ahead and link to them in the show notes for anybody who is not familiar with their. Uh, website development product, a lot of customization that can happen there in a relatively short amount of time. It's pretty cool that it gives photographers that control. Yes. And just to mention that one of the good things about Show It is that while I have a lot of tech skills, you do not have to be a tech oriented person in order to use Show It. And I did meet Todd at uh, WPPI this past year, you know, before the world shut down. So, I mean, you know, I met him, I fell in love with him and I was like, oh, I think I need a Show It website. (laughs) So that's how I did the migration over. Yeah, Todd's an interesting personality in that, like, especially initially when you don't know him well or he doesn't know you well and there's just brief kind of surface level conversation, you don't know all that's going on in that that deep mind of his kind of behind the scenes because he's a relatively quiet <laughs> personality. Uh, needless to say, Show It, and if anybody's not familiar, I mean, Show It certainly as a, a service is amazing. And then Show It United is one of the, the best conferences out there. Uh, Coley, if you haven't been, I, I I can't recommend it enough. I had a ticket this year, and then of course COVID. And oh. actually, they just did United Apart. I yes. mean, it ended yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So I was watching. I was tuning in. Good. Well, I, it, you know, similar. We mentioned the cookout earlier, and and when I think about photography conferences in our in our industry here in the U.S., the cookout and United are the two that come to mind as the most community centric. Uh, because you know the reality is that education is plenty and even free on various platforms and and resources, photographers, et cetera, all around the world. Um, but 
while we certainly want to continue to grow as photographers, the opportunity to be able to connect with our industry at a deeper level than just, hey, how's your business doing? Or, hey, when did you get into WPPI? Like actually go deep and develop friendships, uh, I think is super important. And both of those Absolutely. conferences are great opportunity for that. So yeah, here's my, my fingers are crossed for 2021, giving us the opportunity to actually get back to meeting in person at Show It. It was cool to still be able to do that at Cookout this year. Yeah, so I'm going to be speaking at the cookout next year, as I did this year, but clearly I was remote this year. And um, the tickets for United for 2021 just went on sale. So I'm going to buy my ticket today. So I do hope to see some of you there in 2021, the back half. It's going to be better than the front half. Yeah, (laughs) hopefully by then we have a a bit more of a refined process of managing COVID in place and a vaccine, and and we can actually get to meeting in person again. So um, we'll link to... Uh, that to, to show it united information about show, show it united in the show notes as well. I want to keep going though. We have so much to talk about, Coley. Um, talk to me about customer experience and more specifically, a big idea that drives the customer experience you provide. So this is going to be weird, but the first thing that I think of when I think of providing a wonderful customer experience is you simply have to deliver what you have promised. So if we go back to my brand statement, if I'm promising that it's a photo experience that no one is going to whine about at the end of the session, if everyone is like, oh, that was the worst experience ever, then I have clearly not delivered on my promise to give you a photo experience that no one whines about. So it's about making sure that everything in your brand is aligned from your website, which brings your clients in to your CRM, which brings your inquiries into clients. And then of course, when you actually do the session and what you deliver after the session, make sure that what you've promised is what you deliver. I'm so glad that we're on the same page about this. This is so huge because we talk endlessly about brand position here and the significance of it on the podcast. We have dedicated episodes to the topic, in fact. And, and yet one of the most important things that I don't think we probably haven't said it enough is not just that you actually state what your brand stands on, the idea that it stands on and hopefully is different than others in the marketplace, uh, but then you actually follow through on that experience. It's so important. How do you, I mean, do you, do you have some kind of checks and balances in place that assures that you are delivering on that experience consistently? So I do. When it comes to like the final gallery that I deliver, I go through the images and I make sure that there are at least, you know, 30, 40 percent that are off the cuff, you know, completely unplanned images that show their real life versus, you know, asking them to go cook something in the kitchen and smile while they do it, which is not totally something that I do. But I mean, just to make my point, I do go through the gallery and make sure that it's reflective of my work, that I think that I got, you know, the best of what their family does together. And, you know, that's just my promise to my clients is when I deliver your final gallery, I have made sure that I have captured you authentically, which I apologize. I know that word is overused, (laughs) but that I have really gotten the essence of what it means to be a member of your family and hang out with you for a day. Man, again, I'm so stoked that we're on the same page with this, but I love that you go back to your gallery and make sure the images also back up what your brand says it's about. Because I've noticed consistently that that doesn't happen. Uh, One of the things that I do when I do these brand position consultations for photographers that come on the show is I'll go and look at their so-called competition, the, the other photographers in their marketplace. And you'll see photographers just kind of posting you know, whether it's two or three words, you know, what, I mean, something that became so popular, I think it's fading finally, but um, it became so popular for a while in our industry is to pick three words that represent your brand. <laughs> and it yes. was like cute and joyful and romantic or, you know, some, something kind of, I mean, frankly, kind of trite like that. And, and then you wonder how much they actually, the photographer actually thinks about those words or whatever phrase they came up with to represent their brand, because it doesn't actually match consistently with the imagery that's being depicted. And so I think that's super important. I mean, there's consistency in the brand that in a super noisy world, just in general, but certainly in the photography industry where there's so many photographers competing for the attention of a potential customer, if we don't deliver consistently on the brand promise, then we're less apt to stick out in the mind of a potential photographer or a potential client, A. And then when they become a client, they're less apt to talk about us because there is a disjointedness, if you will, Mm -hmm. between the brand position statement and then the experience. So I, I love that you emphasize this. 
Absolutely. The alignment is not there. So let me just throw my three words out because they're no longer on my website. But we'll see if you agree. <laughs> okay. My three words as I remember them were authentic, yeah. emotive, and fun. Yes. I mean, th- you, you mentioned earlier how the word authentic is overused. But the thing about using a word like authentic is that it means a variety of things to a variety of people. So what does you know, what does somebody do, a potential client do when they see authentic? What does that actually mean for them? And I don't know, maybe some could argue that the the kind of vague nature of it enables the the photographer to connect with a variety of clients. I, I mean, you can make arguments in a variety of ways. To me, I want simplicity and specificity, words that can't be confused. When you say, mm-hmm. I deliver an experience that nobody whines about, there's no confusion about what that means. It means one thing, and it's probably going to mm-hmm. make them smile, in fact, which is pretty brilliant. And then, <laughs> and then you follow through and deliver on that experience, and they walk away yet again smiling and then wanting to talk about that experience to others. I think it's wonderful. I mean, a majority of the time when I'm walking out of someone's house, we're already planning their next session. I happen to have a lot of clients that I see multiple times in a year. So, I mean, when I'm walking out the door, the kids are already asking, mom, when is Miss Coley going to come back? And so it, you know, it helps, it helps me get rebooked. (laughs) It also makes sure that, you know, I, I have delivered what I said I was going to deliver as I walk out the door. Talk to me about time. Uh, We talked about your family a second ago. So you're, you're juggling running a business with being a mom and a wife, and then hopefully having some type of independence, a little bit of free time on your own, or at least some headspace occasionally. How Mm -hmm. do you, is there a particular concept, an idea, principle that you've implemented in your life that enables you to have what works for you as a a so-called healthy balance? So it's funny, when I actually first read this question from the notes, I thought that was going to go a different direction. This is better. Okay. Um, So before COVID, I travel to photograph families across the country one time a month. And honestly, that is my headspace. I love getting on a plane Mm. and being able to walk away from my own family one time a month and basically immerse myself into someone else's family. Hmm. It totally gives me joy. So that's what I do for myself because the majority of the time I will go a day ahead and just stay in a hotel all by myself and not have to worry about what I have to cook for dinner or whether or not I have to take Chloe to school. Um, The other thing that I do when I'm local and it's in non-COVID times is I have a rule that I shut my computer off at three o'clock every day when I go to get Chloe. Wow. So I don't check client emails. I don't do any of those things from my iMac. Now, occasionally, if I'm waiting for a client to, you know, tell me something about our session the next day, I will check on my phone, but my computer is off every day at 3 p.m. I haven't been able to keep that up during COVID because of, you know, everybody's in our house and Chloe is doing remote schooling. But I mean, that gave me a lot of joy because if I turn it off at three o'clock, that means that Chloe gets like a dedicated two hours with me every day yeah. between when I pick her up and then when James comes home and then I cook dinner. And so that was just my way of making sure that I had balance between work and my family life. Okay. So I have a couple of questions here. I want to start with one that's a little bit selfish because this is, this is a conversation that my girlfriend and I are having kind of like on and off and have been having for a while now. And it's, it's around the convers- or this, this topic of independence. You mentioned the importance of, I mean, you've been married for, for 20 years um, the importance of being able to have time to yourself. And uh, I, I wonder, what does that look like? I mean, I know that whether we have photographers listening in who are working with their partner or maybe are, you know, they're in a relationship regardless, maybe their partner does something else, but, you know, the importance of a healthy relationship begs the the question, the conversation around independence for the sake of the longevity of that relationship. How have, how have you worked that out with James? I, I don't know that we necessarily worked it out as much as I told him this was what was going to happen. <laughs> and then it just happened. Yeah. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm a Leo. My husband's a Leo. My daughter's a Leo. There's a lot of there's a lot of bossiness in this household. But when it comes to, you know, telling my husband what I need after 20 years, I just continue to tell him, this is what I need. How Mm. are you going to get it done? Mm. And one of the things that's different between James and I, and I mean, Nathan, you've, you've been with me on photo trips, you know, WPPI and the cookout. I love to travel and my husband does not. So honestly, the fact that I travel once a month to photograph other families across the United States, it's, it's a testament to me being able to get out of my own house and travel. And I don't necessarily have to drag my husband along with me when I know that that's not something that he enjoys doing. 
Huh. Well, that, so, that, that works out anyway. To come back around to make sure that I answered your question. Yeah. It's that I tell him what I need and then it gets done. I mean, in non-COVID times, we, you know, I have girls nights out, we have dinner out. None of that has happened in the last eight months. And it's mm. a little depressing to think about it. Sure. But other than that, I mean, I, we have a calendar and whatever I need, I put on the calendar and he just makes it work like whatever he has to do. Wow. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. And I mean, it's, <laughs> at the end of the day, I, it, you know, communication, of course, every relationship in our life, whether professional or personal, if it's going to be good, any good, it, it, we, we have to communicate the, the freedom that you feel at this point and, and the need that you saw to just simply state what it is that you need. Um, is that's super important. I know that, I mean, mm-hmm. countless relationships that I've either heard about or had conversations with or otherwise, you, you find out that there is an apprehension when it comes to just simply voicing your feelings, what you need, what you want, what you think about, what you're interested in, what you don't want. Um, it, it's, it says a lot about where you all are at in your relationship, that there is the freedom to be able to do that. So that's really cool. And maybe a conversation for another day. I actually started a, a podcast years, two years ago. Uh, or so, um, centered around relationships called a love portrait. It still exists. It's I out did there. not know that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and yet I had to, I had to put it on pause because I just felt like I was juggling too much. I, I was just having a conversation with my, my 15 year old daughter, um, the other day and I, and talking about starting it back up. She was, she was like, you know what? I've got some time. I can, I can edit podcasts for you. And, uh, oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Well, Haley, it, it wonderfully produces this show mm-hmm. and has for a number of years now, but uh, for that other podcast, I think I'm going to be starting it up here again soon, and Addison is going to be editing for me, and I might reach out to you again, Coley, and see if you and James might be willing oh, to come on the show. that would be amazing. I mean, you know, I, I tell everyone all the time that communication is key to making sure that your marriage lasts. And so he appreciates that I'm straightforward. That is one of the things, though. You know, some people like to beat around the bush. That does not work with my husband. (laughs) I have to flat out tell him what I need. And he just says, "Okay, I'll make it work. Well, I know you well enough, Coley, too. I know that (laughs) you're not one to beat around the bush, too. So that that's also helpful. But that's cool. Well, and and for anybody who's listening, who's curious, if you just want a little taste of that podcast, um, I love portrait. We'll link to that in the show notes at bookapodcast.com as well. But I want to keep moving. We have so much to talk about still. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about delegation, the significance of outsourcing or delegation as it relates to managing time. Is this something that you experimented with? So you and I had briefly discussed this. So this is actually a good segue. So back in 2016, for those of you who haven't seen it on my blog, I had a pretty big medical issue where I lost my eyesight for a little while, which sounds really scary as a photographer. But at that point, I couldn't cook dinner for my kid and I couldn't walk around my house without help. So that was more important. But one of the things that I saw after this happened was that, um, you know, if all of a sudden my eyesight never returned, I had no way to tell anyone how to continue my business and deliver the things that were already in progress or things like that. So from actually from that day going forward, I have, I now outsource my edits. And one of the reasons is my neurologist said that my time on a computer has to be limited. So honestly, anything that I don't have to do that takes up a lot of screen time, I will delegate it. And for me, that is images, because when clients come to me, they come to me for one of two things or both photos and then the videos, the videos, I have not figured out how to outsource to anyone. <laughs> I, I don't know that I'll ever get to that point. But the images, I mean, I have a recipe for that. Hmm. So, you know, delegating that to someone to edit is fantastic. It gets hours off of my, you know, yeah. weekly work yep. schedule. So that's the number one thing that I do. The second thing that I do, which is the topic of this podcast, is CRM. I have always said that your CRM can be almost as good as a virtual assistant that you hire, Mm. depending on the level of automation and efficiency that you have put into it. So those are the two things that I do to delegate in my business. Okay. I want to get back to specifically, and of course, we're going to get into CRMs, but I want to talk to you about this, this process of delegating your editing work because... I'm really curious. You mentioned something which is so important for everybody listening in and certainly a good reminder for me as well, which is the importance of of your business being able to function for the long run, scalability, and ultimately having systems in place that can be communicated relatively easily to someone else so that if you can't implement them, they can. Mm -hmm. This this concept or these concepts are discussed in in depth in a book called The E-Myth, uh, the more recent version is called the E-Myth Revisited, and we'll link to that in the show notes. It's been mentioned before in the podcast. 
Uh, but it's really important. Now, in order to put those systems in place, uh, you have to, A, not you specifically, Cole, anyone mm-hmm. needs to know, number one, what it is they actually want. Because one of the things I've realized over you know, years working with photographers at Photographer's Edit is that many cases, photographers aren't actually super clear about what it is that they want. They have an idea, but they're also interested in other ideas, and they kind of want some input from us. And so if if you're going to begin the process of delegation, for those of you listening in, Whether it's editing or album design or admin work or whatever it is, if you're going to begin that process, be clear about your systems to begin with, what it is that you are looking for in that image processing, in that email communication, in that album design before you begin delegating to somebody else. And then you have to learn how to communicate that information to somebody else in a way that is relatively easy for them to understand, that makes sense to them and the way that they process words, which is funny, you know, like white balance means a million different things to different people. If you say white, warm white balance, they're Mm -hmm. going to see something different in their mind's eye. So to that point, Coley, I'm curious, what was to you the most important principle behind enabling you to communicate what it was that you wanted clearly to the person or the people that you were delegating your editing to? And you know, I'm all about being clear. So the one thing that I want to say that comes up a lot when I try to convince family photographers to outsource their editing, they're like, but nobody can do it like me. I'm like, but do you have a system? Do you have a recipe that you're doing with your images? And then on the back end, after you have delegated to someone and it comes back and it's not what you want, it is your responsibility to go back to the person that did your editing and you explain what you would have done differently or what you expect to be different next time. That's the part that I think a lot of photographers miss is that they they hire a company, they send their images out, and when they don't come back like they expected them to, they're just like, oh, outsourcing is just not for me. Yes. No, I just want to reemphasize right now as a photographer who uses outsourcing that it's going to take four to five times until you start to get them back exactly like you want them. But that's not sending it in and then getting it back and not giving any feedback. So first, I think before you try to delegate, you have to have a very clear way of your system of how you do your edits. Number two, you have to be clear when you communicate that to the people who are doing your editing. And then number three, when you get your first, your second, or your third session back, you have to come back to them and explain the tweaks that you made in order to deliver it to your client. Because then they know that, oh, well, that's what they expect. And that's what I'll do next time. Ah, you're such a great teacher. Um, but we're going to have to do more episodes <laughs> together. This is, this is really great. So I, you, you just laid that out brilliantly. And, and I just have to emphasize or highlight again that one of those points that you made in particular, which is the need for ongoing communication, because you're right, photographers way too many times. And, and you know, I, what I found, at least with, at Photographer's Edit, is that photographers will get to they'll wait until they're in busy season and mm-hmm. in like freak out mode when they don't have any time and they need their orders rushed and, and then they submit their first. And, and by the way, no, no judgment whatsoever. I get like being in that space and being like, crap, I need help. But they're in that, that mental space. They're in a rush mode. They send the, the first order in and you know, whether they didn't communicate what it was that they wanted clearly in the process, or maybe there's a chance that our team screwed up something. Maybe the white balance mm-hmm. was a little bit off here or the contrast nonetheless, they get the order back and they're not 100% happy with it. And instead of, as you pointed out, Coley, taking the time, because we actually have a really great feedback system built into Photographer's Edit, taking the five minutes to to give that feedback through that system and asking for a redo, which doesn't cost them anything, they'll just get pissed off and, and either leave or pissed off, send us a note, and then still process it themselves. And they it's don't, such a shame. Yes. Yeah, they don't realize it's such a, a shame process. that people do that. Yeah. Exactly. So there's opportunity to to ultimately get so much of our lives back. And this isn't just about editing anything that we delegate by being willing to, first of all, give up control of that. But secondly, and to Coley's point, taking the time to actually develop the relationship, which involves communication, the back and forth, the feedback, uh, that is super important. And of course, that can't effectively happen unless we f- first establish a workflow a process, which we can communicate. Oh, at, you're, you're so great, Coley. This is super good stuff. We could spend a whole podcast episode <laughs> just on that. <laughs> we could. And I just want to add in one more note, guys, for your listeners. If you guys are thinking about starting um, to outsource your edits, September is not the time to do that. (laughs) January, February, March, April. Those are the times to do that. Take one of your favorite sessions that might've been a little hard to edit and send that into someone 
to get them to edit it. And then when they come back, you already know what it looked like when you delivered it. That's a really good way to start Mm -hmm. that feedback process Mm -hmm. before you're in the thick of it. Because when I first started to do this, I did it in January and February. And then by the time September came around and I had, you know, two to three sessions a week, I mean, you know, they knew what I want. They, They knew what to expect. And when I got them back, I have a general rule. I don't tweak more than 15 minutes. If I get a session back and it takes me more than 15 minutes to, you know, remove a couple that I'm like, eh, yeah, those don't, th- those, th- those didn't look as good as I thought they would edited or to tweak, you know, white balance or something else. If I have to spend more than 15 minutes, I will send it back with specific things of what I need. And I mean, I really don't have to do that anymore, but just keep that in the back of your head in that when you get it back, it is your responsibility to communicate back with your editor. It is not a one-way street. I want to transition to the next question. And and you you did set us up for this earlier. You mentioned the difficulty that you've had with your eyesight. And so reading isn't something that, that, that would naturally happen as a result. Is there, do you, instead of, you know, normally I ask about the most impactful book, but is there a particular source either of education or inspiration or some combination of both Um, that you've benefited from over the years that you would want to tell our listeners about? So I don't want to say over the years, Nathan, but like this is the year that I discovered podcasting. And I know that sounds really silly, but some of my friends have told me for years because they know that I do not read. They have told me for years that I really needed to try to listen to podcasts. And I was like, you know, I'm just really not into it. And I finally realized it was because I was listening to people with annoying voices. (laughs) (laughs) If I listen to your podcast and you have an awesome voice and you're someone that I would just have a, a, a conversation with anyway. Sure. I I'm loving podcasting now. So I listen to the Boca podcast <laughs> every week. Thank I you. listen to this. Uh, this can't be that hard by Anami Tonkin. And then the newest one that I discovered is the breakthrough brand oh. by Elizabeth McCravey. Okay. And the thing is when I'm in my car now, when I'm sitting at home and I'm, you know, doing something other, some other kind of client work, I have podcasts just going all the time. And it's not that you guys are saying things that I don't already know a majority of the time. It's that when I hear a podcast and you guys, you guys usually give me something that I'm like, oh, I should do that. So I also leave like a little notebook (laughs) next to me when I'm listening to a podcast so that if something that the interviewer or the person that they're interviewing says sparks an idea, I immediately write it down so that I don't forget. Huh. Okay. That's interesting. Because yeah, I mean, I've heard photographers talk about whether it's podcasts or Netflix or whatever, playing something in the background. And my thought is, uh, and maybe this is projection because I'm not good. I'm not a good multitasker. I assume that, you know, that content really can't be effectively or consumed uh, and certainly applied, but you're saying actually that it it can be helpful. You just grab these little nuggets and then make Mm -hmm. notes in your notebook. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, there's, there's several things that I do on a computer for my business. I do things in my CRM. I'm answering emails. I'm sending out things. Most of those things are mindless tasks now <laughs> sure. because, you know, I'm just editing a template or, you know, sending a canned email or modifying a proposal. Those things I can totally listen to podcasts or even Netflix in the background. It's only when I'm making films that I don't listen or watch anything else because all of my concentration has to be on the films that I'm creating. Fair. Well, and it's cool that you've made that differentiation, too. Um, breakthrough brand. I, I pulled it up here with Elizabeth McCravey. We'll link to that in the show notes for anybody who's curious. And and you've got me curious too, Coley, because I could very much relate to you. I will listen to, uh, and I'm not going to name names here because I'm, I'm actually generally impressed with the podcast and the value that I've gotten from it and actually from the host over the years. But this particular host that I'm thinking about, that one of the things that drives me crazy is that they they just talk at, at such a slow pace and kind of... <laughs> stutter and him and ha and you know at this point years into the podcast I, and this being largely their profession at this point I, I would assume that they would have refined the communication process that they'd understand that many if not most people in 2020 can't stand to listen to somebody talk slow a eh? and <laughs> and then also want some kind of a refined level of communication and that just hasn't happened so i'll actually flip it on like one and a half x to speed it up at the very mm-hmm. least Uh, And at least in some cases, and, and that kind of makes it easier, but I totally get what you mean. I think production value, audio quality, a tone of voice certainly can make a big difference when it comes to listening to an end product in a podcast. Uh, I can very much relate to you. Yes. And Nathan, I could listen to your voice all day long. (laughs) Uh, That's, uh, that's super kind of you. I really appreciate that. Well, I, I hope that, you know, you mentioned something and I just want to throw this all out there for, for the listeners as well. 
I, I will be the first person to acknowledge that with most of the topics that we get into, I mean, certainly and largely actually because of the amount of time that we have that we're limited to, I try to keep it to about an hour, um, that we don't go super in depth. But my goal always, 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 whether it's in that initial set of questions or I'll, in, in the, the kind of primary topic at hand today being CRMs and, and booking clients easily through CR, with CRMs, um, that, that we somehow leave, even if it's a small nugget, something that is actionable or applicable. And you're going to hear, those of you listening, listening in, you're going to hear repetition because I think there are some topics, at least based on my observation of the photography industry, that we need to get back to over and over and over again um, because habits need to change. But, but ultimately, I just hope that everybody is walking away with even something tiny that they can go and apply to their business regularly through the podcast. That's certainly a goal. So uh, I really appreciate you listening in, Coley. And actually, mm-hmm. certainly, of course, you being here and adding to that library. And and <laughs> we're going to get to the primary topic at hand now, which is around CRMs. You know, back in episode 209, quite a while back, January of 2019 is when we released it. But we had Lauren F. on, on the show and talked about creating a consistent client experience with CRMs. You alluded to that very idea earlier, Coley, that the importance of the consistency and the experience and CRMs enables that. But today we're going to get into more specifically how to book clients easily using a CRM. And I'm going to assume that, you know, 95% at least of our listeners know what a CRM is, but can you at least share what that acronym means for anybody who is not familiar with it? A CRM is a customer relationship manager. Okay, very good. And it just means, you know, it's a piece of software that you use to manage your clients, which is funny because you don't actually have to have clients in order to effectively use a CRM, but that's a topic for a whole different day. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. But I mean, of course, the reality is now that that we have these tools in CRMs, and there are a variety of them to choose from. In fact, I want to let you share in just a little bit about some of the ones that you've used. But um, we have these tools that enable us to help create a more consistent workflow. And and you're going to speak to enable us to book clients more easily. It can it can be done without it, but we're way more effective as business owners with them. How long have you been using a CRM? I've been using a CRM since 2016. So, well, actually, it might have been 2015. So a little over four years. Okay. And and actually, do you mind just going and sharing the, the various CRMs you've used and, and then certainly so, the one that you're using now? Absolutely. So the first one that I started with was 17 Hats. It was the first one that I'd ever um, heard about. Okay. And the 17 Hats being all of us as solo entrepreneurs wear a lot of hats in our business. And so the idea of 17 hats was to kind of balance all of these different roles Uh, that you play as a business owner and put it all into one place to manage your business, which was brilliant (laughs) at the time. Yeah. About 14 months into using 17 hats, I was looking for something more and I didn't quite know what that was, but then I discovered Tave. Now Tave is uh, now owned by Shootproof. Yep. And it's a super awesome um, CRM. And it's especially useful for people who love data. Like data-driven people will love Tave because their reporting is out of this world. But then again, I was looking for something new. I was really happy with what Tave did behind the scenes, but I wanted my client experience in the CRM to match what they were getting from my website. And that just wasn't possible on Tave. So now I am a Dubsado user. I've been with Dubsado for three years and it does almost everything in my business for me. (laughs) But the one thing that I like about Dubsado versus every other CRM that's available is that they allow you to really highly customize everything behind the scenes using either their native information or coding so that, you know, when a client goes between my booking form and my website, they really can't tell that they have switched websites. It's pretty awesome. Huh. Okay. So customization for the sake of that consistent experience. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, what was the, I mean, what was the impetus? You were talking about how it's not necessary, but obviously it's helpful. So what was the impetus then for you to even begin using a CRM in the first place? Oh, I'm sure many of us can um, understand this. <laughs> I was tired of going to multiple applications to get something from a client. So, you know, I was sending my emails in Gmail. I was doing all of my invoicing in PayPal. I was using mock forms to get my contracts and collect my retainers. Yes. I was saving, you know, I was making PDFs in uh, Adobe, uh, not Illustrator, good InDesign. I was making my pricing PDFs in Photoshop or InDesign. I mean, just so many things I could not keep up. And so 
you know, once you get with a CRM, you can do almost all of those in one place. Even though I also use QuickBooks, I mean, a lot of the CRMs out there, if you're just looking for like a basic um, accounting piece of software, a lot of CRMs will also do that for you. So just having everything in one place was super important to me. So simplicity, would you say that was the most immediate benefit? Simplicity and efficiency. Okay. Yeah. I I talk about the idea of simplicity, at at least one component, major component of it being minimizing the number of moving parts and whatever it is that we're doing. In this case, we're talking about the number of you know, pieces of software it takes to run a business, a CRM enables you to consolidate all of that into one place. Mm-hmm. That's pretty powerful. Okay, so let, let's just, speaking of actionable items here, will you give our listeners three to five specific ways that that using a CRM in your photography business enables you to book clients more easily? Because this is, this is what makes our conversation here unique. And I would just love as much detail as you can give us. So what I want to say about booking your clients through a CRM is that almost everything that you do, you do over and over again, whether it's the email that you send them after you get their inquiry, or if it's the pricing um, catalog that you send them, or, you know, the time frame in which you send them client questionnaires, all of those things you are doing over and over again. Mm. So why not put all of those things in one place so that when you need to tweak them or you need to send them or you need to access them, it's so easy. So first, First of all, the first thing that I say for booking clients easily is that when you are putting a lead capture, either you're sending them a link to it on your social media or you have it embedded on your website like I do, that lead capture is the first piece of information that you collect from your potential clients when they inquire. So that should feed everyone into your CRM so that you have one local place to go for all of your clients. So your lead capture form is important. The next really important thing is having your canned emails or your templated emails easily accessed and able to be sent quickly and then customizing. Because when a client sends you, I don't know about you guys, there's a there's a big thing that's going on about whether or not you should respond to inquiries immediately because then they'll you know have that expectation of you just always responding to every email immediately. But I feel like as someone who you know runs out and hires people and sends a form, it's really nice to get an automated response that lets me know that they received my inquiry. Even yeah. if they don't answer me personally immediately, it's good to know that, you know, the form went through, that they've got my information and I should hear from them soon. So canned emails and automated responses for that are really good. The third and perhaps the most important is the booking process itself. So in Dubsado, that booking process is using a proposal. And there are three parts of a proposal. There's the basically where the client is selecting what they want to book. That's the first part. The second part is it immediately takes them to their session agreement or their contract to get that signature, to make sure that you're both on the same page in terms of what you're delivering and what they can expect. And then the last step, of course, most people might think that's the most important part, is actually getting money from them. Now, when you don't use a CRM and you're kind of sending those things separately, every time you have to go back and forth with an email, that's a potential place where you could lose someone in the booking process. Like they send you what they want to book. You're like, okay, let me send you a contract. You send the contract. You're waiting for them to sign it and get it back to you. And then you're sending them an invoice. Yeah. right. As much as you can automate those three steps, that means that someone could go from being an inquiry to a booked client in less than five minutes. It's amazing. Wow. So that's the most important thing to myself and to the students that I help set up their back end is that that booking process, that proposal Um, should be straightforward, it should be clear, and there shouldn't be any steps in between where you could potentially lose somebody. Oh, this is good. Okay, I want to kind of go back through each one of these and ask you some some follow up questions. But one of the things that that you mentioned before you you stated those three points was the significance of our ability to be able to scale our efforts by automating these repetitive tasks. Uh, That's super. I mean, communication certainly is one of those things that we can automate at least to a point. Are there other elements of your workflow that you've been able to automate through the CRM? 
Yeah. So I automate a lot on the other end of the booking. So once they've become a client, I actually have an entire second workflow that starts that, you know, thanks them for their booking, confirms that they are in fact booked. It also sends out any pre-session information that I need to get to them. I personally send out a really detailed questionnaire, but I know other portrait photographers, they send stuff out like style guides and information to different locations for your outdoor portraits. And then there's, of course, the communication right around the session. So I send out an email that, you know, confirms the session day and time. Um, On the other end of their session, the day after, I send them an email that thanks them, says it was great to meet them, includes a sneak peek and my model release, because I'm one of those people, my model release is actually separate from my contract. So I send it to them with images so that they can feel confident in what I got before they give me permission to use their images for marketing. Okay. And so that's the reason that you're doing that. You're keeping it separate. Yes. Okay. Got mm-hmm. it. And then on the other end of that, I'm re-communicating, you know, this is what you should expect. Your images will come to you in the next 14 days. Your films will be somewhere between four to six weeks. But I'm just making sure that I'm re-emphasizing all of the different procedures that I have so that no one is left wondering, oh, I wonder when this is going to happen. I mean, you never want your clients to have questions. You should always be answering the questions before they come to your client's mind. And then of course, you know, in the delivery, I send them links to their galleries and all that. Almost all of that can be automated. Even if you're going in and you're adding in, you know, the gallery link or you're doing these things, you can have the entire workflow set up so that if it's something that you're supposed to do, it can give you a reminder, like a to-do on your task list so that you make sure that every client is getting the same process as everyone else and no one is falling through the cracks. You know, you mentioned, well, I, there are a number of things here to, to kind of touch on, but ultimately the, the importance of proactively giving information to clients um, mm-hmm. so that they don't have to ask you for it. This is so, so important. And this is something, honestly, that we continue to work at, at Photographer's Edit, kind of behind the scenes, because, you know, clients may not necessarily know that we made an adjustment for this purpose, but I want to make sure that despite the fact that outsourcing editing can be relatively complicated because you're talking about a lot of different moving parts, a lot of customization, at least for our brand, I want to make it as easy as possible for them. So if, if I create a workflow for them or even share information about our services with them that leaves them asking questions, I feel like I'm not doing a good job as a business owner. Um, so it's super important. And I'm really glad that you highlight this to proactively design your website and your workflow in such a way that your clients aren't left with questions. And if you know that they're going to have a few questions as a result of the information being provided, make sure it's readily available. They don't have to go searching for it or sending you an email or otherwise make it as easy as possible in that way. That that's super important when it comes to creating a scalable workflow and a great experience. Um, I, I love that you highlight that, but going on to those, those three main points around making it easier to book clients. So the lead capture form to feed them into your workflow. I mean, could I see this? Is it on your right now, if I'm on your website? Uh, yeah. If you go to coleyjamesphotography.com forward slash contact. Yeah. Okay. And, I'm going and actually I'm a little weird because I have three different contact forms on that one page. Oh, I You'll see, see that. the three tabs. Yeah. That's because I service three completely different types of clients. I have my family clients who hire me for, you know, photos and videos. And then I have commercial clients who hire me for the same things if they're brands that cater to families. And then I also have people who just randomly contact me to license footage for their, you know, commercial work. And so I have those three. Oh, and then actually the the third one that's on there might be the mentoring. So I have three different, you know, types of clients that I deal with. And I just want to make sure that I'm getting the information from them that I need. Because one of the things that I heard on a podcast recently is if someone's coming to you for, you know, in my case, if someone wants to license an image, they shouldn't have to answer questions about when they're due (laughs) or what hospital they're delivering at. They should be able to give me the information that is most pertinent to the service that they're inquiring about. Right. Right. Yeah. And and if we don't, then we're falling short. Yeah. I I just, I can very much relate to that conversation because it's something that we're continuing to try to refine um, in my own company, but I'm I'm on your contact page. And for anybody listening in, you're going to want to go take a look at this because this is, I don't know that I've ever seen this before, where as Coley pointed out, there are three different tabs, family, newborn sessions, mentoring, and then branding and commercial licensing. And by the way, the, the, the layout and design is beautiful. It's very clean. Um, and very seamless too. If I click on one tab, it just fades into um, the next contact form. I click on another one, same thing, fades into the next one. And it's relatively detailed there. Um, and that information then automatically gets fed into like an organized format mm-hmm. there in your CRM. Is that right? 
Yes. And they they automatically come in into Dubsado. And depending on which one of those three forms you fill out, you actually get tagged on my back end uh, to let me know what kind of client you are. And it automatically starts a workflow that is appropriate for the type of service that you are interested in. Uh, okay. So to that point, actually, and, and I want to get to your second point, which is making sure to utilize the email templates and of course the automation and communication. You mentioned your workflow just now, they get tagged, it automatically feeds them into the workflow. Of course, templates, email templates and communication relevant to that particular type of client and their associated workflow. Do you and does the Bsado enable you to be able to create templates, Coley? Because I'm I know listener even they do. My, Okay, that's brilliant because I I'm listening to you talk and I'm even like, well, maybe I need to sign up for Dubsado and I can I get <laughs> Coley's templates or her workflow templates? Because it sounds like you've just kind of thought of everything. It is. So actually, Dubsado gives you quite a few templates that are defaulted that they have created. So in other words, like, you know, if someone makes a payment, they already have a templated email that goes out that says, thank you for your payment. Or, you know, the things that are related to uh, processes that are internal to them, they have a template already created and you can just go edit that template. Now, if there are different emails that, you know, you send to your clients. So, for example, if you wanted me to photograph your family and you sent me um, an inquiry from the family form, you would get an automated response that says, hey, I'm really excited to talk to you about um photographing your family, I you should expect to hear with, from me within the next 24 hours. And in the meantime, here's some other things that you can look at that will give you more information about, you know, the family services that I offer. And then it has links to, you know, five things that we do during a documentary family photography, wow. you know, other other things that are like informational. So that email automatically goes out. And that's one that I created it, you know, it wasn't already in the system. Okay. So, but is, I mean, do you sell your templates or do you? So I don't sell my templates currently. It's funny that you mentioned that I am working on a a workshop, (laughs) but it's just for family photographers. It's going to be coming out in January, but they will get access to four different workflows and then copies of all of what we call canned emails in Dubsado. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I might eventually put them up in like a shop, but I'm going to run it through the workshop first to see how it goes. Okay. Well, I mean, sign me up. I'm I'm almost ready to (laughs) sign up just hearing that because I I just love, I love the the, the thoroughness, if that's even a word, of your Mm -hmm. workflow and how you've kind of thought of all the different moving parts and ultimately, of course, utilizing automation because I'm starting a photography business amidst also, you know, running, helping run photographers edit and Milu and running a podcast. And I mean, it's, there's just so many different things. Um, I only have so much time. I still want to have a life with my family and friends and so mm-hmm. forth. So uh, the, the idea of being able to utilize a system like that is really, really appealing. Let me get to the third point that you made, though, and and that is the the booking process. And you mentioned the significance of the the actual process and making sure you're keeping it all in one place. Choice of the service, then the proposal that is put together as a result of that choice, the collection of that payment. And you said that can happen all in the span of like five minutes. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say to you besides yes. And to be honest, I mean, I don't want this to sound like a Dubsado sales call because it's definitely oh, not. No. Yeah, sure. But almost all of the other CRMs have a process like that. Okay, fair enough. So, it, but it's all in one place. And as you said, it kind of minimizes the possibility that the conversation gets lost or disjointed as a result of it being broken up into multiple platforms. Um, and, and then are you able to export your, your financial data into QuickBooks? You mentioned using QuickBooks as well. Is that what you're doing yes. for your financial workflow? So if you integrate QuickBooks into Dubsado, it will send out your invoices. Uh, it as in Dubsado or QuickBooks? Uh, so every time you create an invoice in Dubsado, yeah. it sends a copy to QuickBooks. Ah, got it. Okay. So then you're tracking that financial data in QuickBooks as, as well. Yes. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, that's kind of cool. I I'm going to be using, I specifically decided to use fresh, fresh books. I've used QuickBooks endlessly over the years. Um, I'm actually going to be using fresh books moving forward. And I, I was in looking for a CRM. Um, I, that was one of the things that was important to me to be able to export that data because ultimately I want to be able to manage all the financial data in a separate financial platform. And mm-hmm. that's super important. Okay, good. I feel like you should check HoneyBook. I think HoneyBook might integrate with FreshBooks. Yes. I think they similarly, I think they have a, um, a Zapier integration yes. of some kind of workflow yes. that enables mm-hmm. that information to be exported. Yeah, I definitely saw that. So 
that's that's super important. Well, I this has been really really helpful. I mean, you're such a great teacher number 1 and the the information you're sharing here is super actionable and I'm sure that at least someone listening in um, <laughs> is going to be sold on on potentially using Dubsado as well. I mean, it sounds like it's a really powerful workflow. We'll link to Dubsado in in the show notes. And and by the way, to be very clear, to Coley's point, this was not meant to be a commercial for Dubsado. But I I mean, the way that you're describing it, Coley, is super compelling. And uh, and if it enables these types of workflows, uh, certainly in a very customized way to create a consistent experience for clients and ultimately to book more easily super compelling. So we're going to link to Dubsado in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And maybe just in closing, Coley, if, if you can remind our listeners where they can follow you online. And then if you know you mentioned the workshop coming up, is there somewhere they can get more information about that? Um, sure. So you, my main website is coleyjamesphotography.com. And that's C-O-L-I-E, James Photography. I'm also Coley James on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook as Coley James Photography. But you know, everything from Instagram just gets sent to Facebook these days. Sure. <laughs> Um, if you want to learn more about the CRM blueprint, which is the workshop that's coming out in January, I have a free quick start. If you go to coleyjamesphotography.com forward slash Dubsado, okay. it's a quick start that I put together because one of the questions that we didn't really get to, but um, it's what is the problem with creating or getting started in a CRM? And the setup can be quite difficult, especially yeah. because, you know, all of us with different businesses want to use the CRM in a different way. So I created the quick start so that you can look and see, you know, the very basics of what I think you should use if you're going to use Dubsado as a family photographer. So once again, that was coleyjamesphotography.com forward slash Dubsado. And anyone who has downloaded the quick start is going to be the first people to get the information on the workshop when it launches. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes as well, bocapodcast.com. I, and you're right, I, I did, I accidentally skipped that question about the biggest, oh, no worries. <laughs> biggest challenge beginning to use a CRM. But I mean, that's, that's certainly the, the probably the most common thing that I've heard from photographers getting started, at least with certain platforms, maybe more so with some than others is that that startup process entering all the information creating the workflows. Yes, absolutely. But the one thing that I want to say about all of the CRMs is they a lot of them have incredible free resources okay. for you to set it up. I mean, you know, they have video libraries, they have templates that you can copy from the back end. So don't let overwhelming um, the startup get you to not using a CRM. There are so many ways to overcome that overwhelm to just get started. And again, if you don't do anything else, setting up your lead capture to simply organize your leads is worth whatever amount of money the CRM of your choice is going to cost you. Well, and that's and that's the thing. And we'll, we'll finish with this. It's kind of bringing us back around to something that we were talking about earlier in the conversation, particularly when it comes to outsourcing or delegating. But it just it takes a little bit of time and, and a little bit of effort to invest in a system or a workflow or a relationship mm-hmm. that can ultimately have just pay dividends down the road. And we have to be okay with that. I, I don't want to minimize, you know, how annoying, tedious tasks <laughs> can be. I mean, I, I, I get frustrated with them as well. And we'll, you know, procrastinate or go just go do something else. I get it. But we have to be okay with the fact that it takes a little bit of time to invest in a workflow and a system and building a business and business model that ultimately will pay dividends. We just, we, we have to understand and be okay with the fact that it takes a little bit of time up front. So yeah, investing in the time it takes to set up CRM, a little bit frustrating, but the way that it pays off, the amount of time that it's saved the result, as a result is just mm-hmm. more than worth it. Uh, I think that's a great way to finish this conversation. Coley, you've been awesome. This has been a really, really great episode. Thank you so much for making time for all of us. Thank you for having me, Nathan. I really, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at BocaPodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors photographersedit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.